recently you published this paper with, uh, you know, Cliff Burgess, which seems to solve, not solve, but head into the direction of solving a very big problem in string theory, which is getting four dimensional distributor compactifications. So I want to talk about, you know, the results of that paper. But before we talk about that result, uh, can you briefly describe for the audience, what is the distributor problem in string theory? Very good. Yes, well, it, well, string theory is not fully understood yet. It's only a collection of of of, uh, of ideas, uh, mostly based on perturbative uh, issues in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a theory. So, without having proper non-perturbative formulation of the theory, and so still we don't know what the string theory is. If we want to be critical enough, um, <clears throat> but we know it limits the. Uh, at the weak coupling or uh, large volumes. So then then in those limits, we can do calculations that we can trust. So that's that's essentially the, the limitation of the string theory itself. Uh, and so it's easier to do calculations so you have a flat space time, like a Minkowski. So, and, and that you can have your, your perturbation theory well-defined. You can have a bit of the leading order term, then the next order term, and so on. And uh, if you are a weak coupling, you can you 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 could you trust your calculations because then higher order terms will be uh, smaller and smaller. <clears throat> now, um, now came the experimental fact that uh, in the nineteen nineties, people discovered that essentially the universe is accelerating, and the simplest explanation is that you have a non-zero vacuum energy. And so you have a non-zero vacuum energy. That means you, you combine that with gravity. That means that you have a, a space which is the sitter space or approximately the sitter, meaning that you have a cosmological constant, which is different from zero. That's the, that's the, and it's positive, positive different from zero and extremely small. And that makes the, the what I call the, the greatest puzzle in physics. You know, the, the, the greatest problem is to understand quantum gravity or gravity at the quantum level. But the greatest puzzle is one number that people have been observed, which is the acceleration of the universe. And the puzzle is to, to find an explanation why we, we, we can describe it from a fundamental theory, uh, this period of accelerated expansion. And, uh, and this non-zero cosmological constant is the simplest possibility. And there are alternatives which are just slowly varying cosmological constant, but also uh, um, uh, at positive values. And so for string theory, which is a theory of gravity, that's a challenge. You have to explain that aspect of, of, of nature. And uh, it's an observation, and the string theory has always had the uh, problem that is, is, is uh, that every single theory, any theory that tries to solve the quantum gravity uh, problem is that uh, it has to be a, a theory that is valid at energies which are extremely high. And uh, in terms of uh, of numbers, you, we know that it's, let's say, uh, it's, it's a scale called the Planck scale. And um, to give you an idea, the Planck scale is uh, 10 to the 19 GeV, and uh, one GeV is the mass of the proton. And the highest energies we can reach in the experiments is the ones that the LHC at CERN, which is, uh, um, you know, the order of, of uh, TVs, which is uh, uh, 1,000 or so GeV, mass of the protons. So in that sense, um, we are afraid that, um, that the energies needed to test any theory of, of quantum gravity are so large that we don't have any experimental uh, even idea how to eventually do it. And so you will need an accelerator of the size of the galaxy or something. And uh, and so so and that's a problem with any theory of, that pretends to solve the quantum gravity problem. And string theory is one of those. But then there is this golden opportunity. And you can say you have a fundamental theory. Maybe you, if you can explain this observable feature of the universe, which is the accelerating universe, then uh, uh, that would be a big uh, success for the theory to explain that. And um, 20, a bit more than 20 years ago, uh, people came with concrete um, scenarios for a string theory to achieve that. <clears throat> that was mostly the work of um, Polchinski in particular, uh, uh, together with the Cashew in Stanford, and then then there was a Cashew, Carlos, Lindy, and Trivedi Carlos and Linda from Stanford and, and Trivedi from, from India. 
and uh, f from the Tata Institute, I think. And uh, <clears throat> so th they came up with that proposal, which is one specific uh, scenario within string theory that at the end you do, you can do calculations in the regime that you can trust, this is perturbative expansion, as I told you, and uh, um, that allows you to have uh, uh, the Sitter space. So the solution, which is the vacuum energy, is, uh, is positive. And uh, so that was a big success at that time, but everybody recognized that it was uh, based on approximations. That you have to make sure you can trust them or not. And uh, on that, there was an issue. Um, there were two issues. Uh, one is called um, the Dyn Cyber problem that was realized in the 1980s. Uh, Dyn and Cyber realized that the uh, that uh, essentially the 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 any if anything comes from from a string theory, you will have <clears throat> like a, a scalar potential for any scalar field coming from the theory, like the size of the extra dimensions or so, or even the string coupling, it will always go uh, run away towards infinity. And you you have the the, pot the the potential energy against the value of the field, and and it will always go to to infinity and, and, and the value of the potential will be zero, but the, that zero will be the theory in 10 dimensions or the theory at zero coupling, which is not where we live. <laughs> so what, what we'll, if we want to describe our world, it has to be in four dimensions and it has to be uh, relatively uh, weak coupling, but not zero coupling. <clears throat> like the couplings of uh, any particles to each other, the quarks to the leptons and to the photon and so on. So, um, so that was a problem. So if that was the runaway, we need, but we needed a potential with a minimum at some point, which was positive uh, energy. And then you can have the runaway, but if you have the minimum, then the argument of Diamond Sauer is that if you find a minimum, you are in the regime that you cannot trust your calculations. Your your expansion parameter is is is, uh, is, is not that small. So that means the second next order will be probably competing with the previous order and so on. So you cannot trust the calculations. And in the case of uh, KKLT, this uh, 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 as people I told you that that had achieved that in, in twenty years ago, um, it, you included that kind of that kind of expansions, and you had to make sure. And we have been spending the last twenty years, several people trying to understand um, uh, if if these expansions are trustable. And uh, <clears throat> there has been, and that is also um, combined with uh, something else. That is a, what people call a no go theorem. And it very often comes under the name of Maldazena Nunez, but it was known before by Gary Gibbons and 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 and, uh, and the Wheat and others. And uh, <clears throat> that you just look for the classical equations of spring theory or, or supergravity in that time. Um then the generic case is that uh, you don't have solutions that uh, that give you positive vacuum energy. So you you Put your equations using say answers equations that um, in, in 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 the in the linear order approximation or classical order, and then um, then you can prove that uh, the quantity if you have a positive cosmological constant or positive vacuum energy, the quantity that should be positive in your equations happen to be negative. So it was a contradiction. So that's what's called a no-go theorem, and. Uh, uh, people that say KKLT, everybody knew, knew about this uh, no-go theorems, but they were only classical. And the elements that KKLT had done include a lot of quantum effects. So in that sense, that no-go theorem was over. I mean, it was not relevant. And and uh, and the and the dyn cyber problem that was you can find a minimum in a regime that you can trust because you have new parameters. And the new parameters are very interesting because there are a huge number of integers called fluxes, like magnetic fluxes. And they have to be uh, quantized, like uh, people do in 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 in, in, uh, in field theory, maybe you know, people, like the direct quantization condition in in for monopoles. If you, if, for people who have heard about that, um, so and the fluxes have to be quantized, and the, these numbers are integers, but the integers can be many values, and you have ten to thousand solutions. So so, so you have so many solutions that uh, that play a role. That are, those numbers you you can play with them and and, and get a minimum. In, in the regime that you can trust your calculations. So that, that was the, the positive part. And that, so it, it's not only sort of the possibility of getting the sitter, which is a big thing, but it also gave you an explanation why 
the cosmological constant that we observe or the acceleration that we observe is so small and that people thought it was zero until in the 1990s. Um, because since you have so many solutions, one of them at least can describe the, the number that we observe. And that is what people call the cosmological constant problem. And that was a real puzzle. And uh, as I remember when we were young with the, with Cliff and, 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 and others, we, always our dream was to say eventually solve the cosmological constant problem. And at that time, the cosmological constant was considered to be zero. So we wanted to find arguments why it was zero. And then the experiments tell you, no, no, it's not zero, but it's extremely small. So the puzzle is even worse because you have to explain that it's almost zero, but not zero. And to give you numbers is the, for the order of 10 to the minus 120 in, in, in natural units. So it's a huge I mean, number of zeros uh, but that, that, that you have to, to explain. And having these solutions allowed you that. So I think uh, that was, a, I consider that a big progress, a big success, but since we since we are addressing, I, I work a lot on that with my colleagues, my, my students, and so on, and we made modifications of that approach. Uh, some we put something called the large volume scenario, with that achieves the same things and, and, and with the, with some advantages. And uh, uh, but we have uh, people say that you you make um, uh, what was called that uh, uh, big claims need big evidence. <laughs> So that means you have solved that problem, you need to provide uh, as much evidence as possible. So many of us have been trying to, to see if there are the, computing the next order corrections to see if they affect those results or if there are anything that can go wrong in different directions. And, and this is very complicated because we don't understand, as I told you before, the string theory fully to, to, to do all those calculations. And, uh, and so it has been challenging. And uh, but progress has been made and many of the of the complaints that could the thing that could go wrong had been proven to be uh, correct so the complaint was not correct so that i mean that, that this has survived in particular Polchinski, in particular before he died uh, unfortunately he died very young uh, before he died he was uh, killing one of the arguments against uh, kklt which I, th I think is it was very, very very convincing so in that sense this has survived over the years but in the last few years there's something that People have revived this because you say, well, there is always this classical issue about the number of theorems. This all needs, all things needs a lot of approximations, and so people say, what about there's some some, some kind of conspiracy that forbids you that eventually, to, in a fully controlled calculation, you may not get uh, the sitter to work, and um, then it, it became more. Um, Remarkable somehow at some point that people made it into a correct a conjecture, and it's called the Swamblen conjecture, and um, that says the sitter may not be a solution, and that has forced some of us to be more explicit in our calculations, or to look for different ways of of uh, of finding the sitter, and this paper you referred to that I did with Cliff and, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it goes into that direction because. Of, Contrary to the KKLT, we're doing everything is classical, and yet we avoid the novel theorems, and then we address also this dying server problem. So I think it's a, it's a step in that direction, but I would not consider the first solution of something, because I'm, I was already convinced that the, the, the whole thing in the past are, are okay. It's only that we, we are, as I told you, we need to provide further and further evidence, and this will be for me a very strong uh, evidence that this, 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 this works. And, um, but as usual in physics, you, you you achieve something, but there are all, all some questions being open. We have to identify the singularities that we get there, and so on. So there are always open questions. But um, um, but I think yeah, it's progress in the right direction. Right. So uh, the kind of compactifications that you have considered in your paper. Correct me if I'm wrong. So if you try to find a stringy origin of those compactifications, they come from F theory. And you compactify them on a six-dimensional, sorry, a club EO three folds, which are six-dimensional, and mm -hmm. then uh, you compactify them again to four dimensions. And in, and if I'm not wrong, then these compactifications are not maximally symmetric in six dimensions, but mm -hmm. they are maximally symmetric in four dimensions. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be an, an interesting solution. But why do you think that this solution took quite a long time to be found? <laughs> yes. Well, there is, I think it's, it's an interesting story there. Um, then I can go back to 1984. In 1984, people were doing higher dimensional theories. 
like Carol's Atlantis, and with supersymmetry, and there was supergravity. And there was a big problem in that sense that, that the, the favorite K theories, like 11 dimensional supergravity, were very nice and like, uh, you know, the, the highest number of supersymmetries you can have and the, the highest uh, the, the dimension. And, and, but they were not chiral theories. I mean, that means that we can explain the standard model because the standard model did make a difference between left and right. So this is chiral. And that's how string theory became prominent because string theory was a theory like that, but it was chiral expanding from 10 dimensions. So you get something chiral. And, um, and then, then, Candelas and collaborators that they found the solution, which are Calabellado, and then you get a solution at, uh, at uh, a classical solution, which has a property that is even though you have the ten dimensional theory is, is a solution, you have another solution which is four dimension, and with the zero cosmological constant in in four dimensions, classically, and and a chiral theory. So in that sense, that that was a, a big progress. But six months before that paper. <laughs> There was this paper of of uh, of uh, uh, Salam and Sesgin that they started with a theory which was a six dimensional theory. It was uh, less ambitious somehow, only six dimensions, but with the advantage that you can go from six to four. You can have a two sphere, but everybody knows about the two sphere. You can do the calculations because everything is uh, symmetric, and then they got the same thing that people got in Calabria six months before. <laughs> you have four dimensions. Minkowski space flat theory with a the chiral theory, and with an extra advantage is that you you started with a potential like nine Sabre claim, and that the energy provided by that potential was compensated by fluxes uh, of magnetic fluxes that, that were competing with that and allowed you to have the the the, the solution. So the, it will tell you, well, this runaway behavior means that there are no solutions in six dimensions. Which is okay because we didn't we don't live in six dimensions. But once you turn fluxes on on magnetic fluxes, which are precisely two dimensional, uh, you can wrap around the so the sphere on that. Then uh, you have uh, four dimensional maximized symmetry solutions. So it's it's like more or less you were forced to compactify, which is always people say, oh, why do we why do they have the extra dimensions too small compared to the original ones? And in this case, it was. The original six-dimensional theory, they, they, had, they had no solutions, uh, uh, maximum symmetric, and, and then it forced you to, to find solutions which were uh, uh, less dimensional, and four-dimensional was the natural one. So it's, I think it's, it was even nicer. The criticism that you could do to this Salam Seskin theory is, uh, is that why six dimensions? Because there is no fundamental theory in six dimensions, it's just a supergravity. And then you have to derive it from 10-dimensional string theory or so. And uh, we revived that for other reasons uh, later on, but there was this challenge of how to derive that theory from string theory. And um, there was there was one paper of um, uh, Gary Gibbons and Chris Pope and Miriam Fetish, I think, and that they achieved that, but in a way that the extra dimensions were non-compact, so they were hyperbolic. So it was not good to describe uh, the four-dimensional world we live. So. And, and and that was, uh, I don't remember, uh, maybe 18 years ago or so. But then 10 years ago, there was a paper by Thomas Green and collaborators. There were two papers and uh, where they this, they managed to describe this six-dimensional theory from F-theory, which is a, a, a version of, of uh, one of the string theories at, at strong coupling. And uh, that paper, for some reason, was overlooked. Uh, we who were working in six dimensions had left, uh, had stopped thinking about six dimensions for a while, uh, and then when the paper came, I, I didn't pay, I didn't realize it came, and then uh, the people who wrote the paper were not very much interested in following up the 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 the, 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 the city or or, or yeah, more realistic uh, solutions. So essentially, people didn't follow up. And only last year, when I was visiting Cliff at the Perimeter Institute, we started talking, well, it would be nice to have these solutions. And then it so happened, as uh, very often happened with Cliff, he had found not only the, the solution that Salam and Sesgin had, but also uh, he, he and, and, and collaborators in 2005, they had found, well, this theory, solutions were, were the city, the Salam and Sesgin were, had found them, had found only Minkowski, which means flat, four dimensions. So, but Cliff had found solutions which were the sitter and anti-sitter, you know, positive and negative cosmological constant, 
um, but um, numerically. So you can. So it was a big, uh, bit of a challenge uh, numerical to find the solutions, but but they were there. So so uh, and then what we did now is to combine the two things to combine the the, the derivation of a. Uh, of uh, the six dimension from from string theory, say from F theory, and then using the techniques that Cliff had used in the past for for getting the C three in six dimensions. So then then we we also we apply to to these equations, which were a bit more complicated, but it, I, again numerically you can you can find solutions. I see. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the salam sazgin solution that you're talking about, that solution was super symmetric, but yes. these later solutions are not super symmetric, right? Absolutely. So yes. so. Uh, doesn't that give you a disadvantage that you will not have that much calculational control over these solutions? Uh, yes, um, yes, uh, it's, it's easy to be super symmetric, but for this, uh, I can. Uh, there is a quote that I I, I I can copy to from Eva Silverstein from Stanford. <laughs> she said that you know it's good to have super symmetry to do calculations, but there are theories that we know are not super symmetric, and still you can trust the calculations. And a, a typical example is all physics. <laughs> all of physics, we have been doing that because <laughs> yeah. physics, there is no supersymmetry in nature so far. So, so in that sense, supersymmetry is a help, but I mean, it's not a requirement. So essentially, everything that people have done in, since Newton to now, all the calculations that we can trust and test experimentally, they have been done in, in a domain that you can you can control your calculations and you didn't need supersymmetry. So in this sense, supersymmetry, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to have supersymmetric theory because you can, it's, it's more restrictive, but it's not a requirement. Right. Okay. So uh, in, in the compactifications that you are working with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So to come from six dimensions to four dimensions, you compactify on this space that looks like a rugby ball. And just like a rugby ball, you have these conical singularities on, you know, the ends. And mm -hmm. uh, if I'm if I'm not wrong, I think in the in your paper you say that that's probably an indication that you have these source brains here. And mm -hmm. there are some fields that become, you know, divergent on these points. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, and you use this uh, thing called, uh, so this, this is uh, something that I'm not familiar with. Uh, this is called point particle effective field theory that I'm not familiar with. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what I want to ask is that do these points, per, you know, uh, make a serious difficulty in your work? Or do you think that this is not that big of a problem? I think you give give this example in your paper about the nucleus that, okay, you can, you know, calculate the energy levels of the nucleus, although the Coulomb potential diverges mm -hmm. at the center. Uh, so, okay, so is it like that, you know, or think, is it more it's, complicated? Yes. No, it's, 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 it's true what you say. Yeah, so, you know, effective theory is, the, you know what the best tool we we have we have had and, and we the way we understand nature is through effective field theory because that helps us understand nature by different scales. So, and uh, so in that sense, um, it, it is the, the 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 way that we we, we can do calculations and, and and control them. And um, but of course, in a string theory, you know, effective field theory means that at some point your 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 theory breaks down and you have to go to the ultraviolet complete theory and the string theory should be that way. But for questions like this, effective field theory should be enough. And it's like uh, you say, well, I want to see what happened in the bulk. And they have these two singularities, as you said, like the rugby ball. And, uh, and so we follow essentially uh, the old trick of having this... Uh, um, pillboxes, like a Gauss's pillbox that you surround the singularity with a pillbox and then you don't know what happened to the singularity, but you can put the, the, the boundary conditions on the on the on the on the boundary of the pillbox and then get information about the singularity. And that people have done, for instance, uh, you know, as you say, for for an atomic physics, um Cliff had done also with this, with some other collaborators, uh, uh, even to compute the, the, the how the presence of the nucleus Changes the energy levels of the atoms of the nuclear the electron in the atom, so you can you can have uh, you can see the implications like a back reaction of this object to to, to your geometry, and uh, so instead of a point which was the nucleus, we have a, a brains now because we have a it's a standard object, so it's, it's a singularity in the in the in the in the, in the six dimensions in the two dimensions x and two extra dimensions of the six, but then they go for our, all of our three dimensional spaces. So that's a, a, it will be like a, like a people will call a three brain. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and well, then the question is, is since you were deriving it from a string theory, you would like to know more details about these three brains. And uh, so that's something 
we, we are working on it just to see, uh, for instance, the simplest example we were showing these three brains, we managed to compute the tension of the brains, which is, is good. It's like the mass, computing the mass of the other. And if it is negative, it may be problematic, but if it is positive, it is okay. So we found it to be positive. We also found that the solution was that, the, that the, these two extra dimensions were bigger than the other four. So in that sense, we can trust the, the, the approximation that we can just go from 10 to 6 and then from 6 to 4 and um, and so on. So we can have intellect uh, tests. Um, but since the solutions we des we described were the simplest we could find, um, so the, the in <clears throat> we can um, see the the, co the we can just assign a charge to these brains, and usually the, if there are the Pochinsky introduced the D D three brains, if it's the D brain, it will have a, a D brain charge. So in this case, the, since our solution were the simplest. We the, the deep brain charge was zero, <laughs> and the same thing. Um, uh, yes, first that, that 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 was, and uh, uh, and the, if you have D seven also, the D seven charge was zero. So ideally, we would like to to have cases where the D three brain charge is non zero, so you can have real D three brains there, and so this looks like a maybe a composite object that con con combines D brains with the orientable planes or something to make it a zero charge. And uh, but again, not knowing the details here is like, like you know, you want to go to the full strong coupling of the quarks to understand what happened in in in, in the atoms. Uh, so it would be good, but uh, but, I mean, but uh, uh, as a as a proof of existence that there are solutions, I think we think is 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 we have it is, is good enough. But of course. We are always ambitious. We want to understand things better. And so we like to understand the, the nature of this uh, singular ideas. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And the YouTube algorithm thinks that you will also like this video.